Hi, I'm Bradley Sowash, and this is Musicality Now. Hi, my name is Christopher. I'm the founder and director of Musical U, and welcome to Musicality Now. I'm excited to be joined today by Bradley Sowash, an educator specializing in creativity and improvisation, someone I've long admired in the world of online music education. Bradley is a multi-instrumentalist, a composer, a recording artist, and an educator. He's the author of That's Jazz, a nine-volume jazz piano method, and he's also well known for his live online group jazz piano classes. Along with Lee Levis, a past guest from this show, he runs 88 Creative Keys, with workshops and webinars that help music teachers bring more creativity into their lessons. Bradley shares a ton of useful stuff in this interview, including the one piece of advice from a restaurant pianist that changed his trajectory from a sheet music reader to a primarily by-ear player. We talk about how the piano can be seen as an orchestra with four distinct layers, and how customizing a melody can be an easy first step into improvisation, and he shares three specific embellishments you can try right now on any melody you know how to play. You're going to love hearing about Bradley's own musical journey, and how all of that has fed into the educator he is today, as well as all the examples and demonstrations he provides along the way to illustrate what it means to bring creativity and musicality to your playing. My name's Christopher Sutton, and this is Musicality Now from Musical U. Welcome to the show, Bradley. Thank you for joining us today. So every time I hear somebody say that, it, and they, the correct response is, thank you for being here. Or, or thank you for having me. That's um, and I often think that my mother was actually a radio. She had her own radio show um, and a local radio station. And I just think it would be so wonderful if she had been able to welcome me to her show, and I could say to my mom, "Thank you for having me." So, <laughs> Absolutely. No, I'm glad. Um, to I, I always knew I liked you, Bradley. I, I was telling you by email I admired you from afar for the last several years. And it's clearly a love of puns that brought us together underneath it all. Um, speaking of things we have in common, you are someone who also really appreciates the importance of musicality or musicianship for being a musician and becoming all we can be in music. And so I really wanted to start off this conversation by asking you, what is musicality? What does musicality mean to you? You know, I can answer that in, in a lot of ways. We could talk about the psychology um, that goes into being a musician, that the, the sort of inner mindset that I know you touch on, we could talk about technique and experience. But the way I use the word musicality is that point where you move from mechanics to organics. So if I'm learning a tune, I often tell my students, it's in this style of jazz pop and improvisation, you need to make it your own at some point and stop thinking and stop being mechanical. Let me see if I can give a little demonstration here. So um, um, suppose I learned this, this little five foot two eyes of blue. So everything is square, everything is there, everything is, is nice and clean, but it doesn't, I don't own it yet. It's not musical, it's accurate, it's not musical. So maybe now I feel it. <laughs> You know, I'm bringing myself into it. So I use musicality to describe becoming what I said, from mechanical to organic. Wonderful. Well, I, I definitely want to unpack some of that later in the conversation and help our listeners understand what just happened <laughs> in that before and after you demonstrated. These days, you are very well known among piano teachers in particular for helping them understand how to bring more creativity into their piano teaching. And I'd love to understand how you came to be such an expert in that area. Were you someone who grew up finding themselves easily creative on the keyboard? Were you someone who felt like a natural or got told they were talented? What did your early music education look like? So my, my music education was a requirement in my house. There were three brothers, of which I'm the youngest, and we all had to study piano lessons. And as it turns out, my piano teacher was the same piano teacher who taught my mother when she was a young girl. So my piano teacher was ancient. And to a sensitive eight-year-old boy's nose, her mothball sweaters and coffee-stained breath <laughs> was um, 
uh, intimidating and strange. And, and, and I also used my mother's own method books because she hadn't changed to any new resources. Um, and so it had the same circles on it that, that she had made um, in corrections for her. And I asked her at one point how, that this was all very nice, you know, playing. But what about, could I write my own music? And as I recall, and sometimes memories and myths blend, I believe she said, why would you want to write music? All the good music's already been written. Um, so I said, well, what about just improvising my own music? And she said, well, the, you know, improvisers use a lot of patterns, so we're going to study hand exercises and you learn patterns. And, and 20 exercises later, I'm still not improvising. And it was just discouraged. So I took the logical step of um, deciding instead of be, being a dedicated musician, I became a dedicated skier. <laughs> <laughs> the obvious plan B. Enough of this. But at the same time during all of that, my family had um, Friday night jam sessions, not sort of in any regular scheduled way, but we just goofed around. There was a lot of instruments in the den. And my mother and father had met by playing in a very local, you know, not big deal, but a local um, big band called the Joe Hoff Orchestra, who was my uncle. And um, so we had trombones and trumpets, and my mother was the singer, but she could also play that sort of um, pumping piano. You know, and and uh, so it was around that. Um, and then my older brother went off to Indiana University to be a composition major. And when he came home that summer, he, he's kind of intellectual and geeky, and, and most of his friends were away, and he was kind of bored, I think, because he decided to... Um, teach me freshman college theory, um, even though I was only eight years old. And, and, uh, and then he did theory, the second year of theory, the next summer. So um, I guess I had this advantage of being around music a lot and um, having a, an early take on, on theory. In fact, I, a lot of the way I got through college was, was tutoring um, other, other students in music theory and even trading theory help for math help, of which I'm terrible at math. Um, so I forgot the original question, but the, the, along the whole way there, nobody ever told me I was talented. Nobody ever said you had a special gift. I've got short fingers. Um, I just liked it. And I just imagined that, um, you know, I would make my own music in, st in spite of not liking my teacher and quitting those lessons. And then around, um, when I was around 12 years old, uh, been, had been composing and messing around with my brother's music theory instruction, we heard a guy in a restaurant playing piano with no music. And it had a little bass and drums and piano. His name was Louis Mendez. And I went up naively and pulled on his pant leg on the, to, to the stage and said, how do you do that? How can you play with no music? And, and he said, Art, without skipping a beat, learn your chords, kid. And, and he was right. And later, um, my, I told my parents I wanted to get to know him, and he, and he became my, my uh, teacher. So I learned some jazz from him and, and, and the whole improvisation approach. Um, and then... Uh, just to take it a little further, when I went to music school, I applied to several music schools and I couldn't get in because I flunked all the sight reading exams. Um, because from there on out, I was playing mostly by ear, looking at the chord symbols, not so much on jazz tunes, but on like Elton John books, looking at the guitar symbols above and making my own voicings and, and singing and jamming and being, you know, um, a rock and roll loving teenager. Um, so... I went to a music, a very small school that didn't have a particularly good reputation um, my first year of college because that's all I could get into. And the, my piano teacher there said, you know what, you're only 18 years old. You can, um, you can still learn to read. It's, it's easier than what you do know how to do. So I, I kind of did a lot of catch up on that. And, and, and now, in fact, let me show you this. My whole teaching philosophy is based on the experience of wanting more teachers to not do the damage that I, that classical training did to me. 
which was inhibit creativity. And I'm so glad I broke out of it. But when I broke out of it, I was never proud of it. I was ashamed of it. Like I secretly improvised on the side. And I secretly figured out songs by ear and joined a rock band and wore spandex. And, and um, <laughs> this is get all that. But I know that this is audio too, but I have this piece of paper here. This is my teaching philosophy in a nutshell. And there's a um, scales here with an ear on one side and an eye on the other. The eye reads and the ear, uh, you know, plays by ear. And those are, in a perfect world, are equally taught and equally practiced. In fact, I would argue that every musician should do 50% of reading and 50% of off-page playing every day um, because they aren't separate. They make, they join together and inform each other to develop, you're going to like this, musicality. So. <laughs> Terrific. Well, I, I want to continue with your story in a moment, but first I want to unpack that a little bit because... I had the pleasure of interviewing your partner from 88 Creative Keys, Leela Viss, a little while back, and she was telling the story of how it was an encounter with you that really unlocked the whole creative side of piano playing and piano teaching for her. And in that context, I think you were talking about, in a different interview, you were talking about how she and you had different musical backgrounds and for you the creative the playing by ear had always been a part of who you were as a musician and i think we understand now how that kind of developed over time but it's really interesting because i hadn't realized it was something that developed over time it wasn't that you were you know one of these kids at the age of three figuring out melodies by ear note by note and after that it was all just instinctive clearly there was a, a methodical learning process going on here and i wonder if we could just pause on that particular example because I think there's a lot bound up in it of, you said something like, from then on I was, you know, playing by ear and going from the chord charts or the guitar chords and doing it that way. And I'm sure to some of our listeners and viewers, that's clear and they get what you're talking about there. But if they haven't explored this idea of improvising your own arrangement or playing from chord symbols or playing by ear, there's actually quite a lot in there and so I wonder if we can just unpack a little bit, what do you mean if we take that moment when you were starting to explore this stuff, you hadn't really been figuring stuff out by ear, you maybe didn't understand chords, you hadn't, as that guy told you to do, learned your chords yet. What did the process look like if you picked up an Elton John book or something? How did you go about that? And how does that relate to being creative or playing by ear? Great. Well, there's another brother, the middle brother, at this time had a band called Live in the Blues was playing around local. I had lived in a small um, steel industry town in, in central Ohio. And, um, you know, and he had gigs around town and was playing um, with a cool saxophone players. You know what I mean? I was like, look, those big guys. And he even plays sax and closes his eyes when he plays. Oh, that's so cool. I want to do something like that. Um, you know, I, I had the typical, if you're lucky, you know, admiration for both my older brothers. And I just wanted to be like them because I was the little the little haymaker was my nickname by them. And I wanted to be the big guys. And anyway, and so the, it was the middle brother who actually broke down the chord symbols for me because the older brother teaching music theory, you know, that gets pretty quickly into like counterpoint and parallel fifths and kind of hard stuff. The um, classical music theory is kind of, kind of misses some, in some ways some, some basic skills, like what in the heck is an E flat major seven? So my first experience with chords was actually not the Elton John books. That followed pretty soon afterwards because he was a big name then. And, um, but I had on my piano growing up, somewhere we'd gotten a great big poster of diagrams of, of all the normal chords on the piano, not just triads, but seventh chords as well. And I remember laboriously going through and learning to play Misty by Hoagie Carmichael one chord at a time, it was like this. Look at the poster. Yeah. Uh, B flat minor seven. I didn't know what inversions were, I didn't know how the chords went together, but I just imprinted the chords to that tune. And in retrospect, it might, it might have started with a little bit easier tune, because it's got some, in, pretty strange harmonic shifts in it. Although maybe not, because it's nothing like learning a tune you want to learn to, to motivate. Um, but, but it shows that my weird roots, when everybody else is listening to um, Led Zeppelin, I, I'm trying to learn a Hoagie Carmichael 
tune on my own steam <laughs> as I want to, you know, it's just a, a very a lot of jazz playing on the on the hi-fi and, um, you know, a lot of music around like that. So I don't know if I unpacked it enough, but it just came from absolute monkey see, monkey do off that diagram. And I didn't know how to even name the notes in the chords. I didn't know that um, that C minor, instead of being C, E flat, G, I might very honestly call it C, D sharp, G. I didn't understand the reason for the note names and um and, and but then you know started playing in rock bands and listening to um, the the recordings they give you and then the guitar player to help you. Hey, then this is A A and G. Okay, I can do that on the organ and um, you know so I'm just holding a lot of organ, wearing a lot, bunch of rings on my fingers for some reason and playing in bowling alleys, um, bowling alley lounges with my mother being the supervisor because minors aren't allowed and um, playing with these hairy guys that are calling out chords. And, um, you know, it's all about chords. The guy was right. Learn your chords, kid. Um, does that answer it? <laughs> it does. It does. And I'm sure we'll talk more about the specifics of piano in due course, but I think it's a really special case playing by ear on piano and there are other instruments that may be similar, but, you know, if we were talking about saxophone and learning to play by ear on saxophone, it's very cut and dry in the mind of the saxophone player. I need to play these notes in this order. I need to figure out these notes. With piano and to some extent guitar, you've got this whole world of arranging, not just playing a melody by ear, but playing a whole arrangement, as it were, by ear, which can come from just the bare bones of a chord chart or something. And I think a lot of what you just said kind of takes for granted how exciting a playground that can be compared to, I'm on saxophone, I better play the right melody notes or I'm getting it wrong. And I just want to pick up on that because I think for anyone in the audience who isn't a piano player or hasn't explored this on piano, I think it's worth just noting that it's an instrument where playing by ear and improvising and arranging are all beautifully blended together in a way that doesn't often happen on other instruments. Right. I mean, even strictly reading musicians, if you push them, pianists, I should say, will admit that, that they won't call it improvisation, but they might call it scuffling. You know, when you're in a choir and you have to play a piece, you can't get all those notes the first time. They learn to, to get what they can. But, you know, maybe we should demonstrate that. that let, let me tell you quickly, my concept of, of piano is that it's an orchestra and there are layers. And there are at least four layers through, and we have to play them with two hands. So the, the, the first, from the bottom up, the first layer is the, is the bass line. Um, and, um, so maybe it's, uh, you know, make a simple song, right? And then the next layer of the piano as we move up is uh, this area below middle C where chords sound the best. Because chords up high, kind of tinkly and down too low, they're muddy, right? So they sound good down there. Um, and then we add to that the melody, but now we've run out of limbs. So we have to, there are all kinds of strategies to get the bass and the chords at the same time, such as stride, or to play the melody in the, and the chords in the same hand. Um, something like, let's say, um, so now we can freeze up our left hand to play even a more elaborate bass, etc. And then in between there, there, there are fills. So that is imitating, um, if you have a bass player, a guitar player on chords, maybe a melody player is a singer, and we have, I'd say, clarinet on the fills, you know. Uh, so there's my fill. It's an in-between thing. So you're right. The arranging is a is a big part of it. Um, but when you do that stuff, people say, "Oh, you're so talented." And I, everything I just played there was stock accompaniments. It wasn't even you know I didn't even take it to the musicality. That so one of the things that piano players don't learn enough and is not talked about enough is what drummers talk about, which is you know what. I need a basic rock beat on this. Boom, boom, sh, boom, boom, boom. Sh. I need a Latin beat. Da, 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 da. And there's the same thing for piano players. There's, you know, stride and walking and Alberti bass and 
um, uh, waltz and jazz waltz and just some stock patterns that once you know the chord, what you do with that chord becomes part of your arrangement. So that's a lot of the, the, the nuts and bolts of what is, is learnable. If I could take this back to Leela Viss for a minute. Yeah, so Leela Viss works with me at 88 Creative Keys. We're, we're business partners in webinars and workshops for piano teachers. And the re, one of the main reasons I was drawn to working with Leela as a business partner is that her training is totally uh, classical, and she loves pop music but never played it on the piano. And the problem I have as a teacher of teachers, a teacher of teachers, is that there is the un underlying assumption that I'm from Mars. <laughs> you're just one of those guys. You're one, you're one of those guys that can just do that. You're just born like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's very important to me that Leela, who now is making beautiful arrangements of, of hymns and is very comfortable with these scales and has become a, um, uh, a on-fire improviser, um, is, is the poster child for that these skills can be learned. And furthermore, they can be learned as an adult. Um, and I would argue that these skills are harder to learn. The longer you, the more classical training you've had, the harder it is to recover and rebuild your ear. And that's not to trash classical music. It's classical music training is very in-depth and very helpful. And certainly I benefit from it and I still practice it, but it's just not complete. It's all, it's all about the eye. Um, and you can't, learn to play by ear by reading little black dots. Um, it has to be a combination of reading, closing your eyes, and sometimes not reading at all. So that was kind of long-winded, but... That was beautiful. I, sometimes on this show, there are moments where I immediately think, I wish I could travel back in time and just show that two minutes to my younger self, because it would have completely changed my trajectory. You know, for me, I... I studied piano for five or ten years without any of this stuff and I had to come back to it in my 20s and started kind of piecing together what you just explained in terms of the layers, in terms of relying on patterns, not just making up each and every note. Mm -hmm. And what had been completely intimidating, like could I sit down and play a whole bunch of notes at once by ear or improvise, couldn't have done it when I was younger despite tons of lessons, tons of note reading. And this new perspective, I began to explore that and began to understand. And with some ear training, I began to actually be able to do it. And so I, I love that you shared that. And I'm sure we've got a lot of people in the audience for whom light bulbs are going off. And they're like, oh, that's how it works. <laughs> that's how someone could just sit down at a piano and, and play this kind of thing. And, and particularly that idea of patterns and that you have a vocabulary or a toolkit that you're bringing to bear. It's not, I must decide each and every note of this arrangement at once. Correct. You have to have a certain amount of things you can plug in that are, are muscle memory or at least mental memory. Um, and so only when that's all secure can you then start improvising over top of it things that are being made in the moment. All of this, as you mentioned, the saxophone player is, is you know, they have their own huge issues uh, such as um, tone production that piano players don't have because you can play the piano with a pencil, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but they still, they were deal with one note at a time. Uh, so we, we have both the luxury and the misery of having um, a lot to do. But on the other hand, nobody so, pays money to go hear a solo saxophone player on a gig. I mean, it's the ability to simulate a band that gives, that makes the piano lovely to listen to it by itself. So. And I... I think we've talked a little bit there about playing by ear and improvising an arrangement. I do want to definitely focus on improvisation in its own right, because that's obviously a core specialty of yours. But let's return, if we may, to your story and, and where you took things from there. You were beginning to understand how to play from chord charts or play a bit more by ear. You were discovering this world of jazz. What happened next in your own story? Okay, so that's, I'm about in high school and the I, I was moving into that kind of music which combines jazz and rock and my heroes were um like chick korea and on the jazz side and people like emerson lake and palmer and and the band yes on the rock side this sort of art rock or you know because of growing around a lot of jazz in the house and let me mention there was a heck of a lot of classical music playing in the house too uh so that there was it was just a lot of music going on and my mother's singing all the time in the car and um so i as I matured, I 
wanted more sophisticated music to listen to. It didn't interest me um, uh, on a musical basis to listen to pop songs, although it did interest me on a cultural basis. I wanted to know the same tunes my friends liked and things like that, so I got the difference. But as I was listening for pleasure, I wanted to hear sophisticated music, and, and, and then electric instruments um, had come out. Um, and so around that time, I, I had a very um, bad broken leg from a ski accident because I was getting into trick skiing and jumping and stuff. And I did a backflip and landed poorly. And I spent about 18 years. Sorry, I, I have to ask at this point, were you assuming skiing would be your career and music would be the hobby or vice versa? Well, sure. Yeah. When you're, when you're a teenager, you can't decide whether you'd like to be a skier, drive race cars or swim with dolphins for a living. It's all very practical at that age, right? <laughs> so, um, no. So, so my, in, my mother wisely got, bought me an electric Fender Rhodes piano um, and it showed up in our den and I, and I've got really involved with that and, and got excited about electric instruments and being like my heroes. And around the same time, the jazz band in my high school um, was, had just had particularly terrific crop of kids at, at that time. And we began to win um, jazz band competitions. And they, they asked, the band director asked me if I'd be interested in improvising an intro to La Fiesta, a Chick Corea standard. Um, and, and so I did that and, uh, and, and began to get attention for that because the piano players tend to get sort of rolled over like a tractor on dead corn to, <laughs> in a big band. You have, you know, um, five saxophones and four trumpets and trombones. It's hard. The piano player can be totally rolled over. So it was neat that I had all this space up front. And so I got a little bit, probably a little bit more confidence than I should have had. I got a little cocky um, uh, about that. And I decided that since I couldn't uh, walk very well for a while, uh, and I would, frankly, just between you and me, I, uh, I was not good at sports. I can't catch to this day because I, I don't have um, – I have uh, some eye troubles. So it was very embarrassing for a young man to just be terrible at ball sports, although I enjoyed track and, and um, soccer I could do. So the point is you're looking for at that age some identity. You're looking for some something to be proud about and something to you know, wow your friends with. And it seemed like music was going to be that for me. Um, so that, you know, that takes me up through high school. You want to wanna hear the whole bio or <laughs> – <laughs> I, I want to hear the big turning points because I, I think that paints a really vivid picture of where you were coming from. But I know that at some point you must have doubled down on jazz and really gone deep there. Okay. And I know you had a, an interesting kind of career, a serious performing career before you really went into education in earnest. So I wonder if you could explain how those things happened. Okay, sure. Yeah. So I went, um, I moved to, okay. So when I went to, college after my first year where I got my reading together and everything, I, I decided to go to a larger school. So I went to Ohio State University, which at the time was the largest school in the world. So it's definitely at 60,000 students. Is, um, and it was a nice chance for me to rethink who I wanted to be because you didn't see the same face every day. Um, and I became a composition major. Um, and it was again, stuck. It was again, a 19th century approach to music. Uh, I was being forced to write fugues, and then on the one hand, and to be more modern, I was forced to write 12 tone music or bump squeak music, you know. And, then, and, and I had no time for that. It was, um, I, I had played too many gigs by then to understand that people wanted to, I wanted to relate to listeners. I didn't want to push for the envelope of the history of music. I wanted to play for people. So around that time, I wandered over to the dance department and took a dance course. Um, a modern dance class and just to see what that was all about. And there was a, a very lovely teacher there and a piano player. And the teacher is now my wife. <laughs> um, so I met her there and although it wasn't, it was a long trajectory till we um, hooked up, but that was uh, uh, the beginning of it. And, the, but I noticed the piano player was playing on the side there again with no music and, and the dancers needed the, the music to, to, to swoop and play, you know, they're, they're doing a waltz and they needed like, um, not just, they needed so they would jump and like the music mattered. 
And I went straight to the head of that department and said, um, I, I need to be a dance accompanist as soon as possible. And that uh, saved me from the tedium of music school um, because I, it, music mattered there. Um, so around the same time, I joined a traveling uh, rock band. And so I was playing dance classes in between classes, studying music and on the weekends playing a lot of rock and roll. And um, uh, eventually I just actually literally physically dropped. I had um, big back aches and, and, and troubles and the, I went and got my kidneys checked and all that. And the doctor said, son, you're burning the candle at both ends. You gotta, you gotta cut something. So I cut the rock band. But the dance thing went on for years and years. I moved to New York City after college and I brought all my little compositions in, a, in, my, in my box. I'd written a lot of music. I wanted to be Aaron Copeland. I have a letter from him on the wall over here. I, he was my hero, but I would settle for Leonard Bernstein. Um, I thought that there was a job occupation called American Composer, um, but it wasn't evident. I, I had a, um, a skyrocketing plummet to obscurity in, in New York City. Uh, <laughs> so, but I continued to play for dance classes for years there. And a dance class, in a ballet class, they often ask for, for um, you know, the music of when the ballet was the popular art form, sounds like this, you know. A lot of Chopin or Strauss and so on. But in a modern dance class, they are just well as say, we kind of want, kind of like peanut butter music and it's sort of like and then you watch the move and you think peanut butter. so that's look out I guess yeah yeah like that the teacher would say later on now we're gonna do some quick footwork da -da 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 -da. you just need to come up with it right there and you need to make it um, square in terms of the phrase length so it fit the dance I did that um, for at least four hours a day for eight years. Uh, that's how I made my living in New York City. Um, and then I'm playing jazz on the weekends at weddings and stuff like that. So just to keep going, we went to, we moved to Belgium because my wife was a um, performing concert dancer and um, she was in residence at the uh, Théâtre de la Monnaie, which is the opera company in, in Brussels. And I, had taken a three-week course in French, and 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 it wasn't very successful, and I couldn't speak very well, um, and so I started doing some gigs as as a um, American pianist that you know that knew something about jazz, and people started really listening and asking questions because Europeans tend to value jazz as an import more than Americans where it's indigenous. And they would say, that's very nice what you played, but could you please play some Thelonious Monk? Um, could, you know, and they're asking for sophisticated, very aficionado type tunes. And I thought, oh my gosh, these people are listening. It matters. So I didn't have anything to do all day because I didn't actually have papers to work. I had to just get paid cash and so on. So I just spent a whole year practicing. That was the year I turned it around. I practiced uh, all day long. I'd go out to the fish market. <laughs> the vegetable market, bring home dinner and then practice again um, because she was buried in rehearsals. So that was that I think at one point in your life to be a professional musician, you, I think the trajectory goes like this. The, the best first teacher you can have is, is almost like a childhood TV show. Isn't music nice? Look at this. Doesn't this sound great? To have you fall in love with it. The next teacher you need has a little bit expect, higher expectations and shows you the ropes and is able to actually give you the skills you need. And the last teacher you need is either to be scared out of your pants or have a complete tyrant who um, forces you to do the, the necessary hard work to take it to a professional level. And I have a theory that if any of those teachers are out of order, people quit. Because if you get the tyrant early on, it'll just break you. And if you're, if you're desperate to learn more and get better at some point, the, the nice sweetie is not going to um, give you what you need to take it to a high level. So that's kind of my story. Then I moved back to Columbus, Ohio for the dogs and babies phase where I am now. And, um, and then for the next 30 years, made a living as a um, concert artist and gigging artist. And you want me to talk about that? I feel like I'm talking a lot, but no. Uh, well, let's, let's pick up in a moment, but just to say, 
I love that model of thinking about the teachers you need to become a serious musician or a professional musician. And those sound like two really transformative phases of your life. You know, I, I was reminded when you were describing the dance classes of this amazing show I went to in Canada once where it was improv comedy, but it was musical improv comedy. Oh. And I was at a very impressionable age where I had no concept of how someone could improvise singing let alone improvise an accompaniment for the singers who are improvising singing. And now looking back, I can kind of understand, as you've been explaining to some extent, how that is possible. And particularly like collaboratively, that just blew my mind. But I, I remember thinking at the time, I did at least understand that is hardcore. Like for that guy to do a show every day and have to respond on the fly to what's happening in a way that resonates with the audience because it's familiar enough that they get like the joke being made. I, I could see how intense that would be to change yeah. you as a musician. And he had to do it whether he was in a good mood or not. You know, that's the other thing about being a pro. You, and every once in a while, some of my students will say, I don't really like this style or I don't want to learn that tune. And it's kind of, oh, you know, I, I, 80% of the music that I played as a pro performer was picked by someone else. I didn't even think of it that way. You know, it's, this is what, it, this is what the, re the set list is. So it's, uh, um, I don't know where I was going with that, but. And it but, sounds like you had a genuine love of jazz. You know, you were describing it as kind of having to respond to the demand in terms of playing Thelonious Monk rather than Gershwin or whatever you might be instinctively wanting to play as an American aspiring composer. But Tell me a little bit about how you were thinking about jazz at that stage, because I know that today, if someone rocks up to BradleySowash.com, they're going to see jazz for the rest of us alongside your photo. What did jazz mean to you then? And maybe you could also share what it means to you now, if that's changed. So Jamie Abersold is a, a wonderful jazz teacher in Louisville, Kentucky here. I went to his camp and he said, jazz is the freest music you will ever play. And that's what resonated with me. I heard that and, and thought, yeah, that's what I'm drawn to. Um, because even though I'd grown up around it and heard it a lot, of course, you, you, most people come, they work backwards in their musical taste. So they start with whatever's current and then find out who influenced them and then who influenced them. And the further you go back, you find that there really is nothing new under the sun. It's just new twists on old ideas. And um, so I, I, what, drove me to it was actually not first the sound, but the approach. So while I've come to love swing music and I, I adore Brazilian, um, the Brazilian streak in jazz and, and, um, and I still love jazz rock, it's, it was the idea that you are not only allowed to, but expected to personalize every moment of your playing. And that just thrilled me. Uh, I, I'm a kind of person that loves to make things. I, when I'm not playing the piano, I'm in my wood shop. I, 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 nothing makes me more happy than being in the zone and creating something. And here is a way that I can do this with music. So to this day, I still describe jazz as an approach, not a style. And that approach involves already knowing the harmony, already knowing the structure, and imposing your own ideas in, onto the top of that. Yes, it's possible to do free improvisation where you just play whatever comes to mind. But most of the time, there's, there's a structure. So jazz is any kind of music where, where people are able to leave the moment, close their eyes, and improvise. So let's look at that. That could involve a hot banjo solo in a bluegrass band. I would say that's jazz. It could involve an older style if anybody would still have the guts to do it concerto player in a classical orchestra setting who actually does not rehearse the cadenza, the big point right before the end of the concerto where they show off. Over the years, that's all been codified and people have learned it and written it down. But the original intent was that the musician made it all up and showed what they could do. If it's a hard rock band and the guitar player's suddenly in the spotlight and his eyes are closed and he's wailing away on a beautiful blues lick, that's jazz. In other words, when we talk about classical and jazz, we may as well be saying, in my book, written and precise and versus deliberately vague to leave room for your own musical input. So that's how I see it. That, 
That's beautiful and really valuable. I, I think we get so caught up in the way culturally we think about genres and, you know, classical is one genre, that means it sounds a bit like this and these are the instruments used and jazz is this other genre and it sounds like this. But I love that perspective that actually it's much more about how you approach the music and how you express yourself and maybe the ear versus eye thing than it is about are you playing seventh chords and, you know, a blues pentatonic when it comes to the solo. Right. I mean, you could play Bach in a, in, in a jazz approach. Uh, you could play... Um, I Actually, a, a year ago I taught a course on the Beatles, Beatles on jazz piano. So it was, you know, rethinking those pop songs in a jazzy way. And, you know, there's... A, there's also, jazz has the vocabulary you just mentioned, a lot of seventh chords and ninths and thirteenths, and those wonderful. You know, this is great chords, and so you, there's just a real rich sauce in the normal vocabulary of a jazz musician that is, that is exciting. So it's maybe a, sorry, it's maybe a redundant question at this point, having just heard that, but were you thinking at that stage and do you think now that jazz is kind of an advanced level of skill or an advanced way of playing music because i know a lot of you know listeners in our audience probably have the same world view that i did in the past which is this kind of classical and rock and then blues is this slightly more advanced creative thing and then beyond that that is jazz and there were definitely some method books to blame for me having that world view in terms of basic, intermediate and advanced and mapping that somehow to the, the genres or the styles. But I, I imagine your answer is no <laughs> to both of those questions. Right. You can. So I wrote the best selling jazz piano method in the world. Is it because it's brilliantly written? I don't think so. Is it because it has cool illustrations? No. The reason it's popular is that it starts simple. It starts easy. It's, it's called That's Jazz. It's a nine book series. And it's because I'm a firm believer in if you begin improvising and playing by ear alongside reading early, then it is no big deal. And if the teacher doesn't show their cards and say, now I know this is going to be really scary for you as it is for me because I hate to improvise, but we're going to try this today. <laughs> you know, you just killed it. In fact, I used improvisation when I was teaching kids as a, at the end of the lesson as a reward. Ah, you played that. You played that so well, and I'm going to let you improvise. Oh, really? What are we going to do? Uh, it was a treat, uh, and, it, and it builds. It actually infor it goes back and forth. It builds expression when you are playing written music and, and so on. But it it the reason historically that jazz is regarded as difficult is that the first jazz educators were teaching in a university environment. And in a university environment, in order to get tenure, you have to be complex and use hard words that the, that the review committee <laughs> doesn't understand. Kind of joking there, but um, it's not uncommon for a jazz text to say something like, in jazz, on page one, in jazz we use modes. There are seven modes. Here they are, learn them in all keys. Okay, I'll see you in a year. Jeez, you know, and that's <laughs> not necessary. Jazz doesn't even, improvisation doesn't even begin with, with crazy scales and chords. It begins with simple uh, personalization of a melody, simple embellishments, phrasing, little things that makes the music your own music. Some people are doing it already um, and not even knowing it, and they get their hands slapped by an overly zealous, um, precise, teacher you can tell I have a chip on my shoulder about that um, and then they it squashes that creativity so there's there's a place for being accurate and there's a place for being perfect but it can't be your whole education or or your suffer you're you because I spend half my time um, putting balm on the burnt wings of recovering classical musicians who are terrified of wrong notes um, and it's just it's not necessary it's music is a blast and do I play wrong notes all the time? The first thing I say in a concert before I sit down, I say, I sit down and I, and I look at my hand and I say, I don't know a lot of the people out there, but I have 88 friends in front of me on these keys. And the second thing I say is, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes tonight. I'm going to have a lot of unintended notes. And, um, but I know that I have a vast skill set that would allow me to navigate those and keep it, keep the music rolling. Um, so I just acknowledge like, it's like, you may as well get a new car and put a scratch in it so you stop worrying about it. 
Uh, it's the same mentality. Yes, of course I'm going to make mistakes. It's, and we're going to have a blast. So um, another way to say it is I think that the jazz approach starts at, uh, uh, let's do it this way. A classical approach starts at perfect. And then you take the merits off for everything you do wrong. And a jazz approach says, the right now this music doesn't exist at all, and anything that I do is a good thing, and it causes the music to happen. So I keep earning points by all the stuff that worked out rather than keeping track of the stuff that maybe didn't come out like I thought. And just to go further with that, half the stuff you play, play that you thought was terrible was actually kind of cool. So even though you didn't mean to play it, if I do this... <laughs> So was that really sophisticated and neat or wrong? You don't know. So, <laughs> I, you know, so you go with it. Okay. Oh, maybe he meant that. Um, anyway. Love it. Well, I, I know that there's a lot of people in our audience right now feeling a new enthusiasm and passion for the possibility that jazz might be accessible to them and improv might be accessible to them. I'm going to ask you for some practical pointers on both of those things, but I'm going to leave people dangling for a moment because I do want to finish the last stage of your story, if we may. You clearly have strong feelings about the way music is taught, and you've moved more and more into education, educating piano teachers, teaching students directly online. Tell us a little bit about that phase of things for you and how you took that trajectory. Okay, so, yeah, I have, I have a little... I, in the movie that they make of my life and put in all the museums. <laughs> they're going, just it's totally teasing. They're, they're, um, there's going to be a, mo a scene called Epiphany on Rich Street. Um, the Epiphany on Rich Street happened when I reached a point in my career where I was playing more and more concerts. And, but at the same time, in order to feed my children, I was also playing um, cheesy little uh, uh, society gigs. Uh, so maybe you're the man behind the FICA tree at a corporate bank meeting for their Christmas party. Or, you know, can you just give us a little music here to warm up the provide social lubricant as the party gets going? And, and just racing around doing all these, uh, you know, working blue collar musician gigs that, that you need to, to fill in the blanks. And at the same time, I'm doing concerts. So there literally was a night where I played um, a Friday night concert i think in cleveland took bows sold cds and signed autographs for 45 minutes drove home and the next night i went to a house or some kind of party and the the i came to the front door in my tuxedo with my gear and the, and the woman said oh you're a musician you can't come in the front door go around back we don't let musicians in the front door and that was an extreme example but i began to feel a, a, a weird pull between on the one hand, people actually paying money to hear me do my thing. And on the other hand, being completely ignored on my daily bread gigs as where the music was, you know, it, I could have just sat there and wiggled my hands and played a recording. Who cared? Um, and so I hit this point where I started, an awful thing happened where I started not caring how I sounded. Um, and the good side of that was I would give myself challenges to stay awake. Let me see if I can play the melody in my left hand for a change and the chords in my right. I wonder if I could play this, let me change keys every eight measures. I would do my things like that. But even that got old. And I just got literally teary uh, or anxious or I got um, uh, to where I couldn't, I would ra I reached the point where I would rather flip hamburgers than trash my art form. Um, and so I was, cry I played a, a bank party and I brought my rig and it was snowing on Rich Street, and I, and I got chewed out by the doorman for coming in the wrong door again with a big case. I set it up. There was a barbershop quartet there who had no singers who had, were out of tune. They insulted me and said, you know, how um, they had to practice and, and not just roll into gigs and did I practice. Then I was introduced <laughs> by the wrong name. Um, and... And I just sat behind this FICA tree on my piano thinking, this is the last gig I'm ever going to play. I hate this. Um, and I walked out with my rig on my little, my rig is a big, like a wagon with my big keyboard on it and amplifier and all that. And I walked across Ridge Street, it's snowing like crazy. And the, the little wheels in the front went in a pothole and my, everything dumped in the street. And my keyboard case opened and a microphone rolled out in the snow. And I'm standing there in a tuxedo in the snow and then the light changed and the car started beeping at me. Get, get out of the road. And I thought, 
I'm not going to be a musician anymore. This is, I am done. Literally, I just hit, that was it. I don't care what I do. Um, and so for about six months, I didn't play anywhere. Um, and then a guy asked me if I would be interested in playing a jazz worship service. Um, and I played in it. And I, so I said, yeah, I put that together. And the people were into it. And I thought, wow, here's one place that people listen is in churches. Um, so I did a lot of church playing. And then I put a sign up down the street and said, jazz piano lessons and my phone number. And, um, and then started to build a studio there. Uh, and maybe I'm going on too long, but let's see that the, I eventually couldn't find books for my students. So I, I wrote my own. Um, and then eventually I sent them to a publisher and said, what do you think of these? And they said, the tunes are great. Write down how you teach. Write the teaching part, too. Um, and then when you're published, you get more attention. And then the next thing you know, you're speaking at conferences and, and getting asked to do musicality podcasts. And, um, and that's, that's, that's been my, my route. I still perform. Um, and I still play music live all the time. A lot of it is in, in jam sessions and just playing with friends. And um, I like to play Irish music and jazz with friends. And I still do maybe 10 performances a year. I played with a uh, professional concert with a string quartet just a week ago. Um, but I don't rely on that anymore. And that pressure's off looking for gigs and being ignored and traveling and being alone and lonely on the road. And instead I get to, to help change people's musical lives. And I, and I love it. It's, I'm all in. It's not, a, it's not something I do wishing I was still out on a stage somewhere. This is what I like doing now. Tremendous. And the, the world of music education and piano teaching in particular is much richer for that epiphany on Ridge Street having happened, no doubt. I know that our audience are hungry for the practicalities, the nitty gritty. We've got them excited about improv and a new perspective on jazz and whether they play piano or not. I know there are some who are like, but what do I do? <laughs> like, what could I, what could I try today or tomorrow? What could I do to explore this? And I wonder if you'd be willing to share, you've had such experience teaching, I know you'll have a real appreciation of both the kind of mental blocks or barriers people might have around improvising, or indeed jazz, and maybe also some of the exercises or techniques or strategies that can help them get a handle on it and get going. Yeah, I can do that. I have a couple of general ways to get started. The, fir the first thing I would just say is what we talked about. Learn your chords. It doesn't matter if you're a piano player or not. The chords open the door to so much. You, you can't hesitate. And sometimes people say, well, I know my chords. D chord. Let's see. That's D. Uh, uh, that's not knowing your chords. You have to be fluent. It has to be instant. So C, F, B flat, B flat, B flat, B flat, B sharp, B, B, A, B, B, C. It can't be any hesitation. And, it, and that is a big obstacle, but it opens up so much. The second thing is, do not underestimate the importance of a steady beat. A few minutes ago, I demonstrated a, a, some deliberately off notes on Mary Had a Little Lamb. But the reason you accepted it was because I kept the groove happening. Uh, so you can get away with murder as a musician if, if the beat is steady. Uh, and so what do we all do? We, we make a mistake. We stop and fix it. We pause. We go back and we work and we and we fix it. And then and then what we're actually doing is burning in the pauses and having no, having no groove. You can literally play garbage, and if you had a, a steady beat, I'll prove it. Let me just set it up. Okay, you're starting. <laughs> All of that was nonsense, but you sort of accept it as opposed to this. Oh. I mean, all that stop and fix, it's, it's right notes with no rhythm is not music. If the beat's not steady, the piece is not ready. So those two are general comments. But in order to personalize music, the process is to to go ahead and use some cerebral devices to know your, to have techniques which you think about and are deliberate. So in a sense, you're imitating. And then after a while, they become 
your own and they come out by themselves. In other words, intuition doesn't just happen. You have, you have to first have to feed in ideas. And there are specific ideas and you can name them. So maybe I, I can show you a couple embellishments that are uh, that can be used on any tune. They're generic. They're just, they're devices, they're tools you can plug in. So does that sound good? Perfect. Okay, so let's say we're gonna play um, uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. <laughs> With, without any patterns or anything. And we would want to go through a nice process where we decide what left hand pattern we want or what kind of a company we want under there or what kind of backing track we're going to put on our automated drum machine. We, we might want to go through that. But right now, let's just look at that melody. And, and there, there are three ways that, that work on any melody to, to dress that up a little bit. And one of them is the easiest of all is simply to repeat some of the notes. It seems simple, but, but. And I'm also grooving a little bit. I got a little bit of a jazz feel going there. Um, so. Um, so by repeating notes, there's other things that come with it sort of instinctively, like their notes tend to move a little bit to make room for the repeated notes. There might be some rest. So other things actually happen if you keep that steady beat. Another real simple one of the three is uh, neighbor notes. So if you live on a hill, as I do, and you go up the hill to borrow some sugar for your baking project because you were out of sugar and you come right back that's a neighbor note so if i have a g and i go up to a to borrow my sugar hey thanks for that and come home i played an upper neighbor and then i get down to my baking project and i realize i have no flour i'm not gonna ask twice to the same uphill neighbor so i'll go to the downhill neighbor and borrow some flour so the definition of a neighbor note is it always comes back and it can be a quick or slow so here would be an example of a, of a quick neighbor note. It's quite classical sounding. But you can also draw that out. So I put both upper neighbors and lower neighbors on there. It's just in a way and back. And But what note do I go to? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> as long as you get back to the note that's the target note, you can play any note you like. And there was, maybe it's a half step, maybe it's a whole step. But what if it's in the key? Just do it. You know, if it doesn't sound good, then change it. Um, so the last one I call fill notes. And they're, sometimes they're referred to as passing tones, although I think of them a little bit differently. When the music has a gap in the melody, a large space or a large interval, you have the opportunity to fill that in. And twinkle, twinkle, the third note of that has just a point right there where it does it. We have the first note of the scale. And the third note is the fifth note of the scale. One, two, three, four, five. Right? So you can simply fill that in. Again, what notes do I use? Try things. I mean, you can get as interesting as you like. But um, if we combine those all three, now that's uh, kind of a simple bass here. Uh, you get the idea. So I'm, I'm, I'm. improvisation in my mind begins with customizing known melodies working with something that's already familiar, but making it your own. Love it. That's such a, an elegant way into improvisation in terms of demystifying it and uh, I guess removing the intimidation factor a lot because you have that known starting point and you're just taking little diversions away from it rather than looking at the blank canvas and panicking because all 12 notes are possible at any given time. <laughs> right, right. And then the other thing about knowing your chords is if, if I'll tell you what terrifies me is eight measures of the same chord. That's 
when you actually just get through the chords on a busy song, it, it takes care of you. There's a lot going on in there already. You know, um, um, I, earlier I did this. So we just, by running those chords, all chord tones, all notes in the chords. Uh, now, that gives me a, a, an obstacle course, like a skier going down the, the hill around the, the gates. Those become chord points where I have to deal with them, and that and that that is uh, sort of the next step after embellishing is acknowledging the chords that are there in in your playing. But yeah, I can't teach it all in today. But <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, on that front, I, I'd love if you could share a bit about how you are teaching these days. Obviously, you have I think at least a couple of very popular series of method books that can be used by students, but you're also doing a lot online. And in particular, you're doing online group piano lessons. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, just to touch on that books, I just saw yesterday somebody said, I see this all the time, you can't learn jazz from a book. That's, a, that's one of those myths that are out there. And the reason I find that funny is every professional jazz musician who I've ever met, and I've rehearsed in a lot of basements with getting ready for gigs, has a, a vast collection of um, jazz <laughs> books. So you absolutely use your ear, but you also, is, there's nothing wrong with, with book learning combined with listening. But yeah, um, what I'm doing now, I, I was teaching in this very room one-on-one for many years, um, and, and I can brag with some of my students. I have a student who went to Juilliard, and I'm various award-winning and things like that, so I, I know that I know how to turn out pro musicians, but that's not everybody's goal. Um, and I b got too busy. I just had too much going on. Uh, and my, again, back to Leela Viss, she said, why don't you get into teaching group lessons? And then also I w I'll call out Deborah Perez, um, who's down in Florida, and she, she came as a guest to 88 Creative Keys Summer Workshop, and she's a big advocate of group teaching. And I was a little bit nervous about that um, because I really didn't, hadn't done it, but I thought, well, I present all over the country as a, as a speaker. I'm comfortable in front of people. Why couldn't I do this? here. So I began to teach teenagers um, four at a time, and it worked out really well. Um, so uh, because if I have it literally off camera here, there are four pianos over here, and I, they could do what I broke down earlier. I could say, all right, you play the bass, you play the chords, you play the melody, and you do the fills and embellishments. And then we would switch that so everybody could isolate those skills with a goal towards eventually playing them all themselves. It just really worked well. Plus, there's a subtle competition. Um, you know, if, if they weren't prepared, it kind of looked more embarrassing in front of their buddies. And so um, I, I eventually phased out all in individual lessons and, and only offered group lessons. Um, and then I started doing webinars um, with 88 Creative Keys. And Leela, again, said, why don't you teach your lessons online? So today, I exclusively teach online live group jazz piano classes. And they are very valuable compared to bouncing around YouTube, looking at a tip here and a tip there because they're sequenced and well-organized. And because the participants get to know each other in our private forum group where they share practice videos and give each other support. And I have uh, detailed resources and handouts and backing tracks. So it becomes almost like a college course where you have the lecture, that's the class. You have a, a lab, which is what, what the private group's all about, putting in practice videos out there, getting the individual feedback. And you get the, um, the textbook with all the resources and, and the backing tracks are very, very important to have to practice with um, a backing track. So I, I just love doing it. I just, when it, every time one of those ends, I'm just grinning and, um, and we have so much fun. So. You know, I, it, it's, uh, I, I'm never going to go back. It, it's, it's where it's at. So, uh, it's Super cool. It's definitely another kind of time travel moment for me where I'm like, I, I wish I could go back and sign myself up for that because that's exactly what I would have wanted to have someone like yourself actually explain how all of these mysterious things worked in a practical way on the keyboard with all these amazing resources. Uh, you mentioned several resources there like backing tracks and the textbook and so on. In the moment for the lesson itself, it's presumably not four students each playing a layer in sync with each other. What's the actual group lesson like, as it were? Um, so there are both 
students on screen and some prefer to lurk or, or just watch only. Um, and that is actually evidence that they have had their wings burnt. Um, as a lot of people have performance anxiety and a lot of my teaching is psychological as well as practical just to help people become in touch with the joy of music making again. And so I highly encourage on camera participation and yet don't, don't force anyone. So how does it look? Um, we, I always start with technique and we just do the scale of the day, which would be um, the same key as the song. And it may not be a normal major scale, it might be like a blues scale or a jazz scale. Um, and then I'll say, um, uh, we, we, ha we have some worksheets and, and things like that. I'll say, okay, Christopher, can you hold up to the screen the, the worksheet where we wrote, wrote down the chords to this song? Um, and then, um, Kathy, could you play those? And so we're, we can hear each other and see each other. Um, and then we'll review a tune and, and somebody will feature it. They'll share where they are on it. So they get, maybe they're, they've got the beginning of it, but they're having trouble on the bridge. So it's, a, it's a, more of a lab thing. They aren't perfecting it. They're saying, you don't have trouble right here. Can you explain again how to walk the bass here? Um, and then and when the time comes where everybody's reasonably competent on a tune, I introduce the new tune uh, bit by bit and, and show it to them both by rote. And I give something called prep sheets where I um, highlight target notes, the main notes in a tune, the, the backbone of a tune um, as a way to memorize it. Um, so it, yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of like that. We usually end up something fun and there's a lot of laughs and, and, and good times. Um, it, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a ball. It goes by in like a flash. I, I, it's, we, ha we, have a, we have a great time. And then uh, every day on, it's, this particular group right at the moment is on Facebook. That's my, where my private group is. Every day there's buzzing activity there about, hey, I, you know, what do you think of this uh, new way that I figured out to play Summertime? I found this neat chord. Oh, that's neat. Show it to me. So there becomes a community involvement, which kind of substitutes for the physical distance um, in between. Gotcha. Well, I, you know, we talk fairly often on this show about the current landscape of online music education and like how difficult it can be for an adult beginner self-taught or aspiring to teach themselves to figure out what's worth pursuing and what's worth trying and what will help them versus just confuse them and it can be really challenging but at the same time my hopes are lifted by initiatives like this that you're putting together where it just creates this whole new opportunity for learning in a really exciting way and like i say you know it's the kind of thing where i think wow if i could travel back and give myself that it would just change everything and so I'm so excited to have people like yourself innovating in that way and doing such cool things in online music education because yeah it's so empowering for people around the world it's fantastic. One of the things that people are concerned about is um, there's always a variety of levels and that's part of the art of teaching in a group and the, you, might, you might be your listeners might be interested in knowing how you get around that. Um, for every tune I offer multiple options um, so, you know, here's an easy accompaniment style. Here's a more difficult one. For those of you who've had a lot of jazz, here's a neat skill you can try. There's always several ways to, to get at it. And it's a little like the one room schoolhouse uh, that my mother talked about going to where there's all the grades in the same room and then there's mentorship going on. And because as a teacher, I give, I try to move that carrot just far enough ahead that it's attainable for each student, but, but is still challenging. And that's the problem with people keep saying, why don't you just pre-record a bunch of videos? And the reason is, is because I like teaching people. I, I know after a while how you learn and what you need. And, and I listen to those comments carefully and watch the, the group and actually structure the lesson plan upon how it's being received and, and what the progress is like. So it's not like this preset course that I just open up and here now we do page five. It's, it, I believe the best teaching happens through personal relationships. And that's, that is achievable online. Terrific. Well, one of the big challenges for me doing this podcast and doing interviews like this is that it can be really hard to not just fanboy out and be super effusive all the time about the amazing people I get to interview. And, you know, particularly with someone like yourself, who I have admired from afar and have such respect for, I've completely failed at that today. And I, I apologize to our listeners if they're like, we get it, Christopher, you wish you could go back in time and give yourself Bradley so much, we, we understand. <laughs> but I hope the point is hitting home. If anyone in the audience does want to explore jazz, explore improv, is a piano player, wants to be a piano player, 
check out bradleysowash.com. We'll have a link in the show notes. And I hope whatever instrument you play, whatever style of music you like, you found this conversation inspiring and given you some new ideas and enthusiasm for pursuing your own creativity in music learning. Bradley, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It's been a real honor. It's been an honor for me too. And I'm, I'm lo it's lovely to get to know you better, Christopher. Oh, hey, one more thing. If you enjoyed this video, please take a second to like it on YouTube. And if you haven't already, please also subscribe to our channel there. That's going to help make sure you get all our latest videos as soon as they come out. And it also helps us reach more people, which means more episodes, better guests, and everybody wins. So please take a second to like this video and hit subscribe.